quote, standing represents a jurisdictional requirement which remains open to review at all stages of the litigation. And that's the National Organization for Women Incorporated versus Scheidler, 510 U.S. 249, 1994. And that is also a United States Supreme Court decision. So when the bank sues you, do they have jurisdiction by having the constitutionally required element of standing by showing a concrete injury or loss? Do they ever present any actual facts that they suffered a loss by you not paying them? Nope. What they do do is try to show that you signed a contract with them and that you didn't live up to the contract. That's a, there's, different, there's a difference between saying that you didn't pay them and saying that you suffered a loss. Now, you, you'll have to do a lot of studying to see the difference, but you know it's there, trust me. You will have to watch the show on foreclosure and other money-related shows to understand that the banks do not loan anyone money. And the definition of money in Black's Law, money in usual and ordinary ex acceptation, it means gold, silver, or paper money used as circulating medium of exchange and does not embrace notes, bonds, evidences of debt, or other personal or real estate. Lane versus Rayleigh, 280. Kentucky 319, 133 Southwest 2nd, 74, 79.81. And that's from Black's Law, 4th edition, page 1157. Now you'll notice it says does not embrace notes. Now take out your Federal Reserve notes in your pocket and look at it, and it says right at the top, that's a note. So when he's talking about paper money circulating as a medium of exchange, he's talking about fiduciary money, which can be exchanged for gold or silver. I mean, if you want to give somebody... Uh, you know, in 1913, when the Federal Reserve first started, when they gave a $20 bill out, it said redeemable in gold to the bearer at any bank. So you could go to a bank and give them a $20 uh, piece of paper, and they would give you an ounce of gold. So they do not loan anyone money. They only loan credit, which can be, they create on computer screens from thin air, and you're promised to pay or promissory notes is what funds that credit and or credit applications. So how could anyone show evidence that they suffered a loss if a man or woman did not send their labor exchanged for bank deposits of pieces of paper to them? They suffered no loss and cannot prove they did, so they have no standing to sue. This is why if you challenge the jurisdiction on the order of in a crime, corpus delicti, or in a civil case, standing, they don't have any standing. Therefore, and they haven't presented any evidence that they have standing. Therefore, they have no jurisdiction over you as they have never present, presented any factual evidence to support their claim. We all understand the common law view on money and debt. Money is exchanged for items one wants if the seller agrees to the exchange. Anything we receive for our labor as having value is usually in the form of a paycheck or a private check from the employer. This, this piece of paper is a negotiable instrument and can be allegedly redeemed at the bank for cash or what we accept as money, i.e. Federal Reserve notes. Actually, we never can redeem them for money as only gold and silver or some valuable commodity like a can of beans or a piece of furniture has actual intrinsic value, and the bank will never give you those things. The piece of paper has no intrinsic value, and its replacement cost is about a penny. Can we ever get gold or silver in exchange for a Federal Reserve note? No. Can what we can do, and the only reason we accept the Federal Reserve notes or checks from others for our labor, is that they can be exchanged at the grocery store or the lumber store, etc., for something of real value. What happens when they refuse to accept Federal Reserve notes at the lumber store or the grocery store? Then what? Their true value will be the heat burning them that the heat burning them can produce. The real question is what would life look at without the bankers creating the credit in the form of checks or Federal Reserve notes? How, how much would a house cost if the bank could not do home loans? How much would a car cost if the bank could not do car loans? If everyone who loaned money actually had to save it up from their own labor, loans would be few to people other than family members. The prices would plummet and, slave, and the slavery would cease to exist. 
when you bought a home or a car, it would be yours, and the state could not lay claim to it as they do now because we don't pay in gold and silver, which is common law money. We can't claim ownership as we paid with debt instruments, and the straw man franchisee, government employee, all one, is the named tenant on the property. That straw man is the tenant. This allows the state to treat us like renters and take the property if we don't pay taxes. You can't tax private property under the constitutions. Private property is a right, not a privilege. So why not make the bankers prove they operated according to the law and not outside of it? Are they in truth outlaws? If they don't recover the money they print from thin air, I won't shed a tear for them. If they break the law, shouldn't we hold them accountable? If they want to work and labor for the money they loan, then they deserve to have it repaid to them or take some form of collateral like a car or home, but not otherwise. Next, although as one of the people and sovereign, I am not subject to legislated law, only common law, and those who are employees of the government or get their authority to operate through licenses from the government are bound by its legislative acts, stated as codes, statutes, ordinances, etc., and therefore I can introduce the codes, etc., as evidence if they have violated them and they violate their own public policy all the time. I mean, if you're a worker at Walmart, don't you have to obey Walmart's policy? So if you're a worker for the government, don't you have to obey the government's policy? If I'm not a worker for the government, why do I have to obey their policy? Next, I will have my court take judicial notice of whatever I want to include to be the law of the case. Since I'm a sovereign, I can declare what laws I'm going to use because the sovereign makes the law. And the sovereign decrees the law as long as it does not injure another and only protects my property and rights. I show it as a sort of contract in this case only. The government does exactly the same thing in its lawsuits against you, and unless you challenge their authority to decree the law, you will lose. This is the very meaning of sovereignty is that the decree of the sovereign makes law. American Banana Company versus United Fruit Company. And that's a U.S. Supreme Court 213 U.S. 347. Then I will present the con conclusions of law or memorandum of law. In this part, I can draw conclusions based upon the facts I have presented and the case law or codes, etc., the law of the case that I've decreed, that have been alleged to have been violated and pray for a judgment in my favor. Sign it, seal it, and then I have, if I have already been sued, I can simply mail it off with a copy of the proof of service to the opposing side and then show the original wet ink signed proof of service along with the wet ink signed counterclaim to the clerk of the court and enter it into the record and also get my copy I'm going to bring two copies. Well, there's going to always be three copies. One gets mailed off to the opposition, the opposing lawyers, the opposing bank or the DA. One gets mailed or presented to them first, and you get proof of that presentment. And then you go to the clerk of the court with two copies. One copy gets entered into the court's records for its file, and the other comp copy is your evidence, and you get them to stamp your evidence. Now you've got evidence, you've got a file stamp copy proving that you put something into the record. Okay, here's an example of a, of a pleading that was entered by allegedly Capital One Bank, who is the plaintiff, and then this is the defendant. And then here's their, this is the caption area. This is what their, this is what the complaint is about, and in this case, you know, they cite the case number, and then they put, it's a complaint for money. Breach of written contract, money had and received, and amount stated, and then they checked off. Amount demanded does not exceed $10,000. And you see up in this corner is the name of the party who's presenting it, so we'll, we'll just look and see, and we'll show you that that is done by an attorney, right? And then the, the this is the court that it's entered into. It's don't even have the court name capitalized, which is very unusual because <coughs> it's always in capital letters. And you can see that this is this is where they this is what they're asking, right?
this is what this document is going to be. It's a complaint for money. Now, if you had, if it was your answer, then the word answer would be over there. Or if it's an opposition to the motion to strike or whatever you're submitting, that's what you're going to put. In a, compl in a counterclaim, it would be trespass and trespass on the case. <coughs> and then you'd have your exhibits or whatever. Here's your, here's your caption. And then below the caption, you'll see, comes now the plaintiff, Capital One Bank, and a here and after plaintiff for all causes of action against the name defendants, so and so, here and after defendants, and each of them, in other words, they, they're suing John Doe's, one through 10, and each other defendant sued as a Doe defendant. So anyway, what I'm gonna point out to you is one easy way to deal with filing a comp uh, an answer to things like this is to just make a photocopy of the same paperwork they presented, only this time you're going to take some, just some white pieces of paper and place them over the things that you don't want to come up. Right. And now, when you make a when you make a uh, scanned copy of this, everything will be the same, except up, up here, you're going to just take your pen and write in your name, John Doe, and your address. And then the position that you're writing in, you know, you're representing yourself in pro per. See? So you just take block lettering and write it in. What the, you're going to write in here, what, the, what, what you're doing. So what are you doing? You're doing an answer with attachments A through C, let's say. You know, exhibits, whatever you're going to put in. And then you, as you've eliminated the comes now, you're going to change it to comes now John Doe. Of course, you're not going to use capital letters. Or you can, what you can do is just take the uh, printer and run a blank piece of page through and, you know, stick, stick your word up there. And in Word, you just type in all the stuff and you print it through on a piece of paper. So when you hold the piece of paper over this piece of paper, you can tell it's going to print in the correct area. And then you take the scanned one that's blank and feed it in and use the printer to print off all the stuff you're going to do. You can hand write in and it's admissible in court. So you don't, you don't necessarily have to um, uh, do it in print with a printer. <coughs> then you take their, their allegations <coughs> and in this case, you know, plaintiff, Number one, plaintiff is now and was all times mentioned herein, either a corporation, a partnership, a sole proprietor, or other legal entity in good standing, and is the rightful plaintiff authorized to collect the debt which is subject to this action? Do you, are you going to admit that, deny that, or have no knowledge? Well, I don't have any knowledge if the plaintiff is a, a corporation and if, it has, if it's rightful to collect a debt. So I, so I just put, I have no knowledge. And you've just answered it. The next one is, plaintiff is informed and believes and on the basis alleges that at least one defendant is an individual who resides in the state of California. Well, I don't know if the bank knows that or not. How would I know? So I'm going to put I have no knowledge. So you see how you go through, you just go through the list and answer it one thing at a time and then go make three copies, send one off to, the, to these guys up here with a proof of service and send them a copy of the proof of service and then take your original proof of service and your original wedding signed answer and go down to the court and along with another copy of it and then the court will take your originals and enter it into the file folder for your case, and you can get your copy file stamped.